Okay, so, yeah, we're on. Okay, so, it, like, you know, one of the things, like, if you practice the observer, it's like all your problems can disappear in a split second, and you're, you know, you're in the observer. But is that like, um, is that like avoiding life? and or not dealing with your problems uh, so like the observer is like a, another tool of numbing out from or escaping life and I just wanted to, to talk about that like the observer is it's like uh, it's like the, the, the observer is essentially being similar to being one with God if that makes sense. It's not like, you know, you're eating a donut or anything. It's, it's, it's a different thing. The intention is actually that of surrender. It's surrendering the ego when one is in the observer position. <clears throat> so, and I just wanted to share some of my experiences for anyone who might have, uh, might be thinking that the observer is not good. It's better to do other stuff. Uh, otherwise one is avoiding doing spiritual work if one can just be in the observer all the time. Um, like I, I, met, I went to meet a spiritual teacher who asked me, who you know, did the observer thing on me and I had a, a white light spiritual experience. And, uh, and it was like the whole world disappeared in infinite white light and it was something that is not Oh, I can describe it. It's like infinite light, power and love. That's beyond imagining. And it, it's obvious in that level of light that no world could ever exist. No this and that can exist. No quality, no shadow, no nothing can exist because the intensity of light is uh, so intense. And you can see like living in this world is like living in a shadow, in a, sh in a dark shadow world of shadows compared to that level of light and it's more beautiful and intense than anything. Now that um, was a glimpse for me of um, uh, you know the source, a glimpse of the source, the level of the source and then coming back identifying again one was you know there was a sense of bliss and oneness and the whole world was illuminated so these were the different levels. So being in the observer, and also there's a few things, like when I went to meet the spiritual teacher, I had gout in my feet, and it seemed to be like a dark day. And the experience after coming out of the observer was that it was a summer's day. And the gout, the pain in the feet, the swollenness had vanished, you know, they didn't exist. So it's like the body healed in a split second. The day went from dark, you know, went, they went from a cold winter's day to a summer bright day, and there was bliss. So, all of that happened in one split second. Now that's not, that's not like that's not the same thing as trying to escape life. That is, uh, that is like, the intention of the observer, which is to let go of one's identification of the personal story, is a, it's 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 a divine process. So every time one goes into the observer, it's dissolving the attachment to the personal story. I don't know if this makes sense. It's not an avoidance. It's not like, well, if, you, if you're in the observer, you're avoiding life, and, or you're not dealing with all your problems in your darkness. Because I'm, this is an advanced question, because some people can go into the observer quite easily, but then when they go back into their story, they think it's too easy, or they're not really working on their problems, you know, and actually it's an escape from life just to be in the observer. And actually you should go back into your, into the, into your head and slowly work through all your problems. And this is that something that's actually not a good thing to do. Um, the, um, so I just want to share my own experience of using the observer, I think for 17, 18 years, is that it's only been good and you know, thing limited. My experience of self has dissolved. My idea of a separated self from being a body, and the personal story has dissolved immensely. There's been greater freedom and light that's come in. So I don't see there's anything bad in it. Of course, when you go into, when you go back into the story, I can understand thoughts of being like it's not a good thing to do, or it's a dangerous thing to do, 
or maybe you're avoiding your life, or maybe you're not dealing with all your problems if you go to the observer. But I would say those thoughts that are coming up are of, of ego origin. You know, they're not, you know, often when something threatens the ego so much and one gets, one goes back into the ego, uh, it can make a hundred reasons. Especially, you know, I mean, I, I talk about this, this group. You know, we have so many people come there and they never come back again. And I totally understand it. It's a very threatening group. Uh, but threatening to what? Is it threatening to the truth or is it threatening to the ego? You know, I mean, coming to this group, going to a spiritual group or, you know, watching TV or having a buffet or <laughs> free, free donuts down the street. It's like the ego will go, that group's terrible. You know, free donuts better on a Saturday afternoon. It's like, that's human nature because the ego is really like anything that takes you to the light. There's a great aversion to it. Uh, and uh, and so that stuff and often when something is really good for you that dissolves your ego often the ego will come up with a reason why it's not good for you um, and uh, you know actually that group is not good you know or there's more interesting things happening than that group or you know being in the observer is bad you know it's avoiding life you're not dealing with your problems if you go to the observer so those are th things but you know, my thing is like, every time, let's say I'm in my head and I go to the observer, it's breaking the addiction, the identification. So each time one goes, there's like a habitual addiction to being in the thoughts, non-stop, going into the story. So each time you go to the observer, you're breaking that, that addictive, habitual thing, go back into your thought and be in your head, if that makes sense. Or if you're a body. There's a habitual addiction to identifying with the body. There's a habitual addiction to identifying with time. There's an addiction to identifying um, with whatever it is, you know, different types of identification. So each time you go to the, you're weakening that habitual observer. So it, it is actually spiritual work. Now, pe you know, people may get confused, it's too easy. Some people may, may actually have this, or I'm avoiding life, or this is not really living life. That's like, that, I mean, I would disagree with that point of view. Actually, it, it's grace. You know, it's such a powerful tool that one minute I can be in pain and the next minute I can, second I can be free. One minute I can be in my story about how terrible life is and this next second I've forgotten my story and there's infinite bliss. And then when you go back into the head, it's too easy or no, it's a bad thing to do or you're avoiding your life. Now, those type of thoughts for me are just ego thoughts, you know. Uh, that, uh, that, you know, I'd say those are ego, ego thoughts, uh, sort of poo-pooing the idea. Because the thing with, if you practice, the, you know, anyone who's had a profound observer experience, you know, you can be in your head, you can be in your story, you can be in your suffering, can, and the next second it's gone. You know, I mean, that for me is a demonstration of the power of the observer. It's, for me, it's one of the most powerful, powerful tools on the planet, if you're able to do it. And it, in fact, it works so fast and so incredibly, and the, the miracles are so instantaneous that it's almost like too good to be true, or, or maybe you're able to say it's actually a bad thing, don't do it again. But I'd say it's actually one of the most powerful tools because it can instantly, if you're able to go to the pure observer in a split second and let go of your story, your pain in your body, the future and the past, I mean, that for me is a demonstration of its power, not of its an avoidance of life or it's not, it's not an authentic spiritual tool. No, let me go into my head and work out the story and forgive the person, you know, because that can happen, you know, it's like actually, no, I, I think I should go back in my head and pray for you for the next three years to let you go because doing the observer and letting go of the story in a split second is wrong. All of these things, but actually for me, if I could let go of the story in a split second, I think I'd rather let go of the story in a split second than go back into my head and then remember why I don't like you and pray for you. <laughs> you know, this is like real spiritual work. I'm in my head praying for you and remembering how bad you are. But going into the observer is like too easy because I just forget the story and I'm just happy now. You know, it's like, that's like, so I just wanted to put that because actually sometimes whatever spiritual tool you get, 
sometimes you can get like a, an aversion against that tool. And that's what I'd say the ego defense mechanisms. Going back to a group which is good for you, to employing a prayer that is good for you, employing the observer which is good for you. So um, don't be, I mean, everyone has free choice, you know, no one has, you know, but my experience is the, the tool is authentic and is powerful and it's very, very, and to be in the observer is a powerful act of surrendering the ego. It's not like, oh, this is too easy, I've been in the observer the whole day, let me go back in my story and do some real spiritual work. And actually, if I'm in the observer, I'm escaping life. I should be in my head really doing life. You know, it's like, you know, those for me are like, uh, that's like a very clever rationalization against being in the observer. Um, okay.